Uh, here again, I'd like to welcome you know everybody to the um, service here this morning, and um, we're going to begin by having uh, Andy come up and uh, give a word for us, and then we'll get right into things here. Good morning. It's good to be back. I've been away for a while. Um, it's, after much prayerful consideration, I came to the decision to resign from the leadership board with uh, health problems at home. And with the uh, last meeting I was at, I realized how much stress I was under. And there's just a lot of things that I was missing. And I thought, you know, it's not fair to the leadership board to add to them uh, more stress. So it'd be better that I resign. I want to say something for our leadership. We've got a terrific leadership board. They're wonderful people. They, they, the last two years, they've really worked hard and, and, uh, and they've done a lot of things to uh, really help the church, get the church moving forward. So I just hope that you, know, you go up and you, you give them a word of encouragement because I'm sure they're tired and exhausted from these two years of trying to sort things out. Uh, I know the Lord's got something for me in this church to do yet. There's other ministries I can be involved in later on. When my wife is getting better. It's going to take about a year for her to recover. And my son, again, has got some issues as well. So. Keep us in prayer. Uh, once again, we have a terrific leadership board. They're wonderful people, every one of them. And uh, I miss you guys. I've been away for a few weeks here, and I really miss you guys. I'm glad I'm back. So uh, God bless everybody. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, I've been handed some, uh, there's some Canadian Baptist at the back there on the table. And so I was asked just to remind you of that, and there's a pile there, you can pick them up if uh, you desire, so. Um, and then uh, also, uh, I need to make an announcement here that um, the, the board is happy to report that uh, they've begun to um, start the process of searching for a permanent pastor. But of course, you realize that there's many, many steps um, that need to be completed before we start such a search. But we're committed to the task, and we'll keep you updated and let you know when it's time to form a search committee. So you can keep us in your prayers for that. And um, as far as announcements, I think there's, uh, you know, all the announcements are in your bulletin. So. When you check that out, I'm sure that will be good. And um, for, for our call to worship, I, I just thought that was something that slipped my mind. But I know in the Bible, we, we are called to praise and to worship God. And that's why we've come here this morning, to praise and worship God. And so uh, we've got a good team here that's going to lead us in our praise and worship. So uh, let's go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jerry. Please stand with us as you're able. Yeah. 
morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to sing these songs of old and uh, great hymns of the faith that teach us uh, the Word of God. Once again, it's good to be with you and to see some new faces. And uh, just to remind you that Neville and I will always be, every Sunday, we're over at the big building in the office. And if you wish to speak with us, please feel free to do so. Maybe just phone us ahead of time. Use the church phone and make sure that we're there or we're not tied up with somebody else. But uh, feel free to come and, and speak with us. Well, we're still working our way through Paul's letter to the Philippian church. I think it will be done by the time of Advent rolls around. <laughs> so, so uh, all right. So you'll turn it in your Bibles. First, we'll pick up with Paul. We left off last time. Philippians chapter 3, we'll read from verse, uh, I'm going to read from verse 7 down through verse 11. For whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained, obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and, and, and training forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. May God bless His word as we have read it together. If we could ask Paul for his greatest goal in life, what answer do you think he would get? Uh, that he may continue to be a great missionary to the Gentiles, that he'll continue to be a great evangelist, winning many souls to Christ, uh, that he may continue to be a great preacher, a comforter to the churches. Those are all worthy goals to be sure, but I don't think that would be on Paul's top of his bucket list. At the end of the day, only one goal reigned supreme, to know Christ. That was his goal. From the time he was converted on Damascus Road to the time the Lord called him home from his prison there in Rome, was to know Jesus Christ. Paul had seen the face of Jesus probably on the road to Damascus. He had been caught up, he says, into the third heaven and he saw things that were inexpressible. And yet he longed for a more intimate relationship with Christ. He was obsessed with Christ. Nothing else mattered. He could afford to lose all, but not to lose Christ. To gain the whole world, but to lose Christ, for Paul would be to lose everything. But to gain Christ and lose everything would be no loss at all. In a word, total focus of his life was that he know Christ more and more. In this passage, Paul likens the Christian life to a, to a race. I'm not sure how many athletes we have here, or maybe you were an athlete back in high school. I see one hand. <laughs> It's not a race that, uh, you know, you run by fits and starts, but one in which you, you persevere right to the finish line. 
You see, it's important how we run a race. There, you know, there are rules to consider when you're running a race. Uh, every race, whether it's a short distance or long distance, there's a way you begin, and there's a way that you, the way in the middle, and then there's a way to end. One runs a 100 meter dash differently than a marathon. You don't begin to sprint away when you run a marathon. One begins a certain way, one continues in a certain way, and one ends in a certain way. Because it's gaining the prize that matters. Now, I know today we, everybody wins the prize in a race, you know, we're kind of that kind of a culture. But that's not what Paul is speaking about here, so we, let's not miss his analogy. You, you run in order to win. That's his point. We, the followers of Jesus, are, are likewise in a race. So how do we run without coming short, without flagging, uh, without quitting? And how do we persevere, not only to the finish line, but how do we run in order to win the race, to win the prize? I wonder, is, is this our life goal as you consider all that you're about today? What's your, what's your life goal? What's your motivation in life? And does the single goal drive us on toward the finish line, as it did for Paul? In this passage, Paul lays down some rules for winning the prize. So, using this analogy of running this race, let's learn the way forward here, so that we too may obtain our goal at the end of, the end of our race, the end of our life. So when running a race, there are some cardinal rules to observe. Cardinal rule number one. If you're in a 100 meter dash, never look back. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. I was my first year in high school, I was 13 years old. I was probably one inch taller than I am today. And a lot more slimmer, a lot more slim. Uh, but I broke the cardinal rule. I was in the race until about 75 at that time, yards down the, down the course, and then I did something totally foolish. I looked back to see where the next guy was. He went right on my shoulder. When I looked back, I lost pace, and he passed me, and he just pipped me to the line. A little swing across the race track. <laughs> Never forgot that. So, how do we obtain this goal, this context of knowing Christ? Forget the past. It's like not looking back, you see. Forgetting what is behind, verse 13. So, what do we need to forget today? If you want to obtain this goal of winning the prize, of knowing Christ more intimately, more and more, what do you need to forget? Number one, Paul says he forgot his past failures, verse 6. You know, as I look back on my life, I, I can recall a great deal of failure. And I'm sure if you're honest with yourself, you too can look back at your life and see lots of failure. Words that we have spoken, actions we have taken, resentments, attitudes, time wasted, it's all there in front of us. As the prayer book says, sins of omission and sins of commission. They're very much with us. But you see, Paul refused to allow his past to control his present. I'm not sure what your biggest, biggest regret is in, is in life. We all have regrets. But Paul had much to regret in his past life. It says, as to zeal, I persecuted the church. I'm not sure what some of the bad stuff you've ever done, but you've ever killed a Christian? That was in Paul's resume. That was in his past. He was guilty of shedding the blood of the followers of Jesus. Remember how he protected the clothes of those who stoned Stephen to death. I don't think he ever forgot the look on Stephen's face as he went down there in that hail of stones. I don't think he ever... And he was, Stephen was praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
I don't think he ever, ever forgot that face. But Paul refused to let his past distract him. You see, he's on a race. Don't look back. He refused to let it break his stride. He allowed nothing to come between him and winning the race. You know, it's not like we, you know, we can't erase our past. We need to acknowledge that. It's not like uh, hitting the delete key on our computer and everything disappears. Of course, it is healthy for us to remember. I have a very good memory. My wife says it's selective, but there it is. <laughs> but I can remember things way back till I was two years old. And that can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse. <laughs> to remember every wrong thing that someone's done against you. You see, our memories can be a stumbling block. They can cause us to stumble on the way. It's like some people cannot let go of some past sin. You ever met people like that? Something in their past that they still are carrying around with them even in the present day. They cannot forgive themselves. But brothers and sisters, we wish to run this race to completion to obtain the prize, we need to take that sin, whatever it is, whatever it was, and lay it at the feet of Jesus, and confess it, and then to forsake it, and then to continue the race. Secondly, Paul not only forgot his past failures, I think he also forgot what he considered his past successes. Verses 4 to 6, and we touched on this briefly last week. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, he says. If anyone had something to boast about in his past, it was Paul. You know, he had this stellar pedigree in Judaism. But everything changed when he met Jesus. All his seeming success, all those things in his credit column, was transferred over to his debit column. Whatever was to my profit, and I consider loss for the sake of Christ. He says that when he met Jesus, that's exactly what happened. Christ stood alone in his life. You know, he didn't stay with his conversion experience, however. Some people are still back the day they were converted, so back to the day they were saved, and they're, they're looking to that, and we thank God for the day that we came to faith, that the Spirit of God took hold of our lives, and we were born again by the Spirit of God. But let me say that conversion is simply the beginning. It's the beginning of the race. I wonder, are we still glorifying in yesterday's victories in our lives? We thank God for every victory, but brother and sister in Christ, let's not stay there. Don't live on yesterday's successes. How well you've done spiritually in the past. Or conversely, are you being hampered by some past sin, some failure in your past that keeps coming to you at you know, 3 o'clock in the morning? Paul says, forgetting those things you've dropped behind, keep looking ahead. Don't look behind. But not only are we called to forget the past, we must also, he says, focus on the future. If you're running a race, you have your eye on that finish line. Forgetting what is behind and straining. I think that word said training. I'm not sure that was correct. And straining toward what is ahead. Verse 13. Call on rule number two for running a race. Keep your eye always on the finish line. Not on the people next to you, not looking behind, but looking at that finish line. Paul's wife was always oriented toward the future. Toward the day when he would see Christ. He wanted to know Jesus more and more. Look at verse 10. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. There it is. That's the goal. The amazing thing about this goal is that Paul had been a, a Christian for at least 30 years to this point. And yet he wanted to know Christ more and more. 
For Paul, Jesus was just a, a vast ocean of discovery. There was no end to knowing Christ. And he wanted to know Jesus in, in three ways. He mentions that here in these verses. I says, I want to know him. Well, not just facts about Jesus, not just the historical Jesus. He wanted to know Jesus in an ongoing personal relationship. Do you remember your courtship days? I remember mine. It was sort of unique in the sense that I lived in Barry, sorry, I lived in Toronto, and Evan lived in Barry. And uh, so it was like kind of a long distance courtship. And you should have seen our telephone bills. <laughs> Those days you paid for every single minute. And we saw each other just once a week. And did we ever look forward, at least I did, did we ever look forward to <laughs> seeing each other that one day a week? We wanted to get to know each other more and more. That's what love does. And I think this is what Paul had in mind. But only to a far greater degree. He wanted a growing personal relationship with Christ. Is there a personal element to you knowing Christ? I don't, I'm not asking how if you believe in Jesus, you know, that he existed. He was there 2,000 years ago, and you may, you may own all the various doctrines regarding to Jesus, but do you have a personal, living, day-to-day -day relationship with him? That's the question we need to answer here. Secondly, he also wanted to know the power of Christ in his life. I want to know the power, he says, of his resurrection. So why power? You see, some people think that uh, religion is like a, is, is, is a psychological crutch. They, they explain it away in psychological terms. Now, some people have a, a religious complex and others don't. But I ask, how do you count for the conversion of Saul of Tarsus? I think he would be on the bottom of the list of thinking, who would God say in this world? Would it be someone like, like Saul of Tarsus? I think not. You see, it took the power of Christ to turn his heart around, to turn him around, so that he may look to Christ and call, for, call upon Christ for mercy and to save him there on the Damascus road. That took the power of Christ. And every conversion, yours and mine included, takes the very power of Christ to raise us up from spiritual death to new life. Power that not only raised him spiritually from the dead, but enabled him to live for Christ. To be able to serve Christ day in and day out. To overcome the power of sin in his life. To keep him persevering amidst all the trials and tribulations and the physical dangers that he went through in life. A power enabling him to live beyond his strength, beyond his means. Again, we ask the question, do we know something of this power? That's what it means to know Christ. Thirdly, he wanted to know something about suffering for Jesus. The fellowship of sharing in his suffering. What an amazing statement that is. I don't think I've ever so I've entertained that for my own life. I'm not, I'm not sure about you. Uh, not in some weird spiritual masochistic sense, of course. But, but Paul realized that Christ suffered for him. But suffered for his sake. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Paul, like Christ, wanted to take up his cross and learn something of the suffering of his master. To identify with Christ's suffering on his behalf. You see, he wanted to know Jesus not just in the good times, but also in the hard times. No prosperity gospel here with Paul. He has suffered more than anybody else that we can think of. Very often, I know that we, com we complain at the first bit of inconvenience in our lives, do we not? God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? But for Paul, it was a way, you see, of knowing Jesus more and more. That's the way he looked at suffering in his life. I'm identifying with my master's footsteps. He carried the cross for me, I will now carry the cross for him. 
course, this is also true of marriage, is it not? Marriages isn't always good times. <laughs> it's also hard times. It's for better or for worse. It's in sickness and in health. For richer, for poorer. But Paul was always oriented toward the future. He wanted to know Jesus more and more in spite of his sufferings. Again, I ask the question, is this, is this our perspective in life as we run this race? Come what may, we have our eyes on the finish line. To know Christ more. Straining, straining, bent, head forward, looking at that line, and going straight for the mark. But not only must we forget the past, not only must we focus on the future, we must also press on in the present. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on. Cardinal rule number three. <laughs> Here we go from a, a hundred meter dash to a long distance marathon. Two hours and what is it? What's the record? <coughs> 20 minutes? Marathon runners speak about hitting the wall. And the wall is where races are either won or lost. It's very much a mental thing, running a marathon. Because after a while, your body is saying, stop, quit, sit down, have a drink. <laughs> this is crazy. But if you are to win, not only to complete the prize, but if you are to win the prize, we must press on to the finish line. It's probably a debatable point in what stage of life is more difficult, you know, as you look at your life. Is it childhood? Is it midlife or is it, uh, is it retirement? You know, some people have very difficult childhoods. There may have been abuse. There may have been a divorce in the family. Perhaps they grew up in poverty. I, for one, can never remember having to worry about paying the next mortgage <laughs> or where my next meal was coming from. We call the senior years the golden years. You know, if you have your health and you've saved up enough money for retirement, they can be very good years indeed. I'm now in my retirement. But now that I'm retired, I've become convinced that the hardest is, is midlife. Midlife. Most of you here this morning. And people of that age are called the sandwich generation. They have responsibilities to children and they have responsibilities to parents. And sometimes it can become very much a daily grind just getting through the day. You rise early in the morning, you have to go off to work, this is pre-COVID, <laughs> and you come home to family responsibilities, day after day, year in, year out. Not that the midlife season is without its joys and compensations and rewards. It's just that midlife lacks the same compensations as does childhood, or perhaps as does retirement. You know, I can sleep in for any time I like. <laughs> in a certain sense, you know, the same is true of the Christian life. It's an endurance race, long distance race. And so, allow me just to wrap up this messaging with three applications about this race, this Christian life that we're living. Number one, there are no shortcuts to the finish line. What do you say in verse 12? Not that I have already obtained all this. How many here ever heard of a marathon runner by the name of Rosie Ruiz? Anyone? No. Oh, the one person. She was a, a marathon runner from Montreal, and back in 1980, she ran the Boston Marathon. And she had a very unique way of completing the race and winning the race. Halfway through the race, 
She dived into the subway system, got on the subway train, took it down from one stop before the finish line, then go back out and then finish the race. <laughs> Fortunately, she was caught in a video camera. <laughs> no shortcuts, you see, to finishing this race. Nothing. So, never quit running. Second, we will never attain the prize in this life. Not in this life. Nor have, I, nor have I already been made perfect, Paul says, verse 12. You see, there's no spiritual perfection in this life. We'll always fail, and by the grace of God, we'll get back up and keep running. That'll be the pattern of our lives from here on in. We're in a long life long marathon. We live between the two comings of Jesus. We live in the in-between times and we're not home yet. We haven't yet arrived. There's no magical formula. Some book you can read or some person on television who says this is the key. No such thing. You never quit running. You never become perfect in this life. Number three, you press on until you see Jesus. That's the goal. That's the prize. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Some of you, again, I, I, I guess I have to date myself because I'm an older person. <laughs> but you may remember the movie Ben-Hur. Anybody ever remember the movie Ben-Hur? It's a classic movie and it still works. You know, some of these old movies are kind of cheesy, you know, but this one still works very much so. You can download it, watch it. The central scene of the movie is the chariot race. There's Ben-Hur, Judah Ben-Hur, racing against Masala. And at the end of the race, Ben-Hur wins the race, and then he's called up by the emperor. Come up, get your prize. And what's his prize? It's just a little salary wreath that withers within a day or two. That's his prize. But he is called up to the victor's podium. Paul, too, is looking forward to being called up being called up to receive the prize by Jesus himself. And what's the prize? Not some salary wreath that withers and dies within a day, but, but really seeing Jesus face to face. Is that him we sing face to face, Christ my Savior? And hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Brothers and sisters, we are when we are called up, we won't be looking for husbands and wives in heaven. Dismiss that from your mind. I love my wife very much. I love my deceased parents. But a lot of them they'll be looking for. I know a brother passed and once said, when he first gets to heaven, he's going to kneel at Jesus' feet. An old Puritan preacher said, when I get to heaven, I'll look at the face of Jesus for a million years, and then I'll take a look around. In any relationship we want more than just a photograph in our wallet or our purse. We also want to see that person face to face each day. Just so we in this life have a picture. A picture of Jesus in our hearts and minds and as we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke and John, we get this picture of him. But one day we look forward to seeing him face to face. So, again, I ask the question, is this what we are straining toward above all else? This was Paul's obsession in life. We, we, we think that Paul is so far ahead of us, and I suppose he is and was, <laughs> but he was human. We can learn from such a godly man, from such a godly leader. Brothers and sisters, let's not stop at forgiveness. Thank God for the day we came to faith, but let's not stop there. That was just the beginning. The race goes on after the starting gun fires. Don't stop with some experience and think that you've arrived. Go on in your request for knowing Christ. He's an ocean of discovery and of joy. Go on till you see Him face to face and you hear from His lips, Well done, good and faithful servant. Until then, press on. Let's pray together. 
Lord God, we thank you for these words this morning. By your grace, cause us to run this race in which you have, which you have called us, not to flag, not to give up, not to quit. But forgetting the past and straining toward what is ahead, maybe, maybe press on to the present until we see our Lord and Savior face to face, the one who ran before us, and to receive our reward from his lips. Well done, good and faithful servant. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us once again as we conclude our service.
Thank you. 